Lord Jesus, as we all know, was crucified on a cross at Calvary, dying for our sins. Five years after that, we have the first record of a Christian martyr, when the newly appointed deacon Stephen was stoned to death for his faith. One of the witnesses of this was a young man called Saul, a staunch opponent of Christianity with a burning hatred of all things Christian. Just a couple of years later, he was on his way to Damascus to arrest and kill more Christians when God stopped him in his tracks and he gloriously trusted in Christ as his only hope of salvation. Within a very short time, he was teaching and preaching the gospel and those who knew his background were astounded. Just a couple of years later, he set off on his first missionary journey with Barnabas. They toured around many towns and regions in Asia, including Galatia, which is in modern-day Turkey. Then, about ten years later, he wrote his first letter, or at least the first one we have in our Bibles. He definitely wrote a letter to Corinth that predates the first letter to the Corinthians. But we don't know when he wrote this, or what happened to it. The letter to which I refer is the letter to the Galatians. The earliest of Paul's biblical letters, written ten years after he visited the place. Galatians is a passionate letter. The outpouring of the soul of a preacher on fire for his Lord, and deeply committed to bringing his hearers to an understanding of what saving faith is. Paul begins in the very first verse by introducing himself as an apostle. He had strong words for these Galatians, and they had to understand that he wrote with apostolic authority. Paul expected that Christians would respect his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He makes it very clear that his calling as an apostle didn't originate with man, and it didn't come through man. It originated with God, and it came directly from God. It was a divine calling made through both the Father and the Son. He says he is writing to the churches in Galatia. This wasn't written to a single church in a single city. This was addressed to churches of Galatia, Galatia being a region, not a city, and there were several churches among the cities of Galatia. The name Galatia covered a territory settled by the Gauls, or Celtic people, and included the cities of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra and Derby. He then gives what would become his personal trademark greeting in writing, Grace to you and peace. Grace was the traditional greeting in the Greek culture, and peace was the standard greeting within the Jewish culture. Paul immediately gets down to fundamental doctrine. Jesus gave the greatest thing anyone can give, himself. Why did he do this? That he might deliver us from this present evil age. The idea behind the word deliver is not deliverance from the presence of something, but deliverance from the power of something. We will not be delivered from the presence of the present evil age until we go to heaven to be with Jesus but we can experience deliverance from the power of this present evil age right now. The people of Galatia have been turned from the life-changing truth of God's word. Paul says in verse 6, I am astounded that you are turning away so soon from him who has called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Paul's astonishment is not that false teachers exist, but that the church was following them. He had expected false teachers. What he is so surprised about is the church is so easily misled. These false teachers are not openly denying the gospel message. They only want to improve the gospel by adding to it requirements, new ceremonies, new standards. It's as if they're saying, we believe in Jesus Christ, but we have something wonderful to add to what you already believe. What is at least implied is that faith of these believers is not sufficient. Something more is needed. 
What they viewed as a different gospel was actually a distorted gospel. Paul says there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. The New Living Translation renders these verses this way. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who, in his love and mercy, called you to share the eternal life he gives through Christ. You are already following a different way that pretends to be good news, but is not good news at all. You're being fooled by those who twist and change the truth concerning Christ. Paul invokes a curse on anyone, himself included, who distorts the gospel. But if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Paul is saying the real problem of another gospel is not only that it's a bad idea, not only that it lacks power because it's fake, but it is dangerous. In our polite English translation, we lose some of the heat of this verse in the original language. Paul actually says, If anyone comes with another gospel, let him be damned. Let these individuals be damned, separated from God, eternally punished. We must not attempt to make the gospel more user-friendly. The key to the gospel of Jesus is not the avoidance of life events, but the possibility to overcome them. Paul has already reminded the believer that it was Christ who gave himself for our sins. Only the true gospel produces real life change. The strongest argument for the gospel of Christ is the personal testimony of someone whose life has been changed by it. When we lose the gospel of grace, we lose the only message that has power to heal. Paul explains to his readers why he is saying these things. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul says he's not trying to be sensational. He's saying these things because there is only one truth, and the gospel message that Jesus Christ came and died for men's sins is the only real truth. The unchanging message for an ever-changing world is the gospel. Paul continues in sharing personal testimony of what Christ has done for him. He was a Jewish rabbi, very zealous and devout in his religion. He killed Christians for fun. He was so antagonistic that there would not be a single Christian at the time who would believe this man would trust in Christ. But then he encountered Jesus. He didn't work out the gospel by logic or intellect, but by di direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He says he has experienced the kindness and mercy of God, who had chosen him before he was even born. God then called him in the well-known story on the Damascus Road, as recorded in Acts chapter 9. It was humanly impossible for Rabbi Saul to become Apostle Paul, apart from the miracle of God's grace. Saul's passion in life has now moved from his religion of rules and hatred and had now become to know Jesus more. Paul says that the end result of his transformed life was that God was glorified. When God changes us and does what we can't do for ourselves, he gets all the glory. It's impossible to reform ourselves but Jesus can transform us. Christianity isn't about trying to change ourselves or make ourselves better. That's impossible. It's about God's grace. God doesn't make bad men good. He makes dead men alive. God's grace doesn't just forgive us, but he gives us the power to have our lives transformed 
and the desire to live for our Saviour. Paul then says he went to Jerusalem to share his teaching with the Apostles. Travelling with him on that occasion were two of Paul's partners in ministry, Barnabas and Titus. Barnabas is incredibly significant in the life of Paul. His name means son of encouragement, and he was the first person to accept Paul and mentor him. When Paul first trusted Christ, he travelled on to Jerusalem, tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. Given his background, his hatred of all things Christian, including the persecution and murder of many believers, frankly, who can blame them? But it was Barnabas who had brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord and genuinely trusted in him. Barnabas also told them what the Lord had said to Saul and how he boldly preached in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Whenever we meet Barnabas in the book of Acts, we see him encouraging and mentoring people. We need people like this in the church who will pour support and encouragement into other people's lives. We need to love and accept one another and help each other to grow in the Lord. Titus was a Gentile believer who Paul had led to the Lord. Barnabas poured his life into Paul, and Paul poured his life into Titus and many others. Paul then returns to his earlier theme of fake Christians. There were some in the church who had wanted to force Paul and his companions to follow their Jewish regulations. But Paul is clear that he refused to listen to them for a single moment because he wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel. Everyone has a different calling from the Lord, a unique calling that's just for them. Some are called to minister to children, some to youth, some to older people, some to the church, some to those who do not know Jesus. For Paul, it was to preach to the Gentiles, he compares his calling to the church giants of his day, James, Peter and John, all of whom were called to preach to the Jews. But these men recognised Paul's calling and welcomed him and Barnabas as co-workers. Paul adds that the only thing that the pillars of the church suggested was to remember the poor, and Paul says he was certainly keen to do that. Paul then says something very interesting, interesting in the dual context of the Roman Catholic claims that Peter was the first Pope and that a Pope is infallible. And yet Paul says he had to speak strongly against what Paul, uh, Peter was doing. Explicitly from the text, it was very wrong. So what was so wrong? In a word, hypocrisy. First, Peter was happily fellowshipping with Gentile Christians until some of the Apostle James's Jewish friends turned up when he stopped because he was frightened of what they would think. He also tried to make the Gentiles follow some of the Jewish law, again just for show, law which he himself had stopped doing. Paul describes this hypocrisy as not following the truth of the good news. Paul was passionately in love with Jesus Christ. He was full of joy and determined to live a life which was pleasing to Christ. He loved to go soul winning and a wonderful servant of the Lord. His love for Jesus was infectious and many were drawn to Christ. A similar issue had arisen with the Galatian believers, to that demonstrated by Peter and James. They clung on to Jewish legalism despite knowing the truth. So Paul asked them, I would like to learn just one thing from you. 
Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? The word foolish here, again, is, is quite a strong word, literally meaning, have you lost your minds? He challenges them. Are they really foolish enough to believe that their position in Christ is consolidated by works of the flesh, despite the fact it had clearly begun in the Spirit? These people knew that they did not get saved by their works, so how could they possibly think that they would stay saved through the works of the flesh? Paul then asks a question, delightfully worded in the Living Bible. You have suffered so much for the gospel. Now, are you going to just throw it all overboard? I can hardly believe it. He then asks whether God has given these people the power of the Holy Spirit and worked miracles among them as a result of their trying to obey the Jewish laws. Of course, it's a rhetorical question, because the answer is, of course not. These things come when you believe in Christ and fully trust him. Paul was also wanting his readers to understand the foolishness of trading God's grace for man's efforts. It's effectively saying, I no longer believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to forgive me of all my sins and keep me close to God. Therefore, I believe Christ died in vain. If righteousness comes by the law, then the death of Christ is pointless. Such a belief damages the relationship with Jesus Christ, since I no longer view him as saviour. Instead, I've done it by myself. In such a belief, we trade relationship for religion. Freedom for bondage, joy for misery, peace for fear and frustration, assurance for uncertainty, and grace for legalism. The law was never intended to save men from their sins. Man is simply not capable of doing this. Instead, we must understand and celebrate the effects of salvation which include learning the meaning of some big words. Justification. My sins have been completely forgiven. Regeneration. I have been made a new person in Christ. Propitiation. God's wrath has been completely satisfied. Reconciliation. My relationship with God has been restored. Glorification. One day I will be just like Christ. Paul describes our relationship with Jesus as Saviour, starting with where we were. We are born into a nature of sin which holds us captive. The Lord teaches us that we are sinners and we deserve eternal punishment. Before you are saved, you are a slave to sin, a slave of fear, a slave of the world and the ways of the world. The Lord teaches all of this, but is powerless to do anything about it. This is the problem, not the solution. So God sent Jesus in the form of a man just at the right time. Jesus was born under the law. He's the only person who the law could not condemn. Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Through him we can be redeemed, so that we can be adopted by God. This was a Roman adoption, in that once a child is adopted into the family, they can never lose their inheritance. A natural-born child can be left out of the inheritance, but an adopted child will get their portion of the inheritance. God has adopted us into his family. Once a person is saved, they are a child of God. The Holy Spirit of God lives in their heart, 
and calls out to God the Father. Because you are a child of God, you are no longer a slave. Instead, you're an heir. You are God's child. Paul loves the Galatian believers, but they have done something totally perplexing. By the grace of God, Paul visited the region and told them about salvation in Christ. Paul ministered in Galatia in all three of his missionary journeys. They responded to the gospel. They grew in faith and had a close relationship with Paul. But for some unknown reason, after receiving their freedom in Christ, they took a turn back to bondage. They started following the regulations of the law. They came to Christ by grace, but they were deceived to think that they must continue by works and merit. It's rather like an animal being freed from a trap in which they are snared, and then running straight back into the snare again. Their relationship with Paul was fractured, their joy was lost, and they found themselves back in spiritual bondage. Paul pleads with them not to continue in that direction. In his first letter to the church at Corinth, Paul claimed to be all things to all men. And we certainly get a taste of that in this letter. He started his letter being tough, calling them foolish. He's been scholarly as well, reasoning with them in a deeply theological way. Now he becomes tender. We see his pastoral heart here. He reminisces about their formerly close relationship and calls them back to living in spiritual freedom. We see him express a deep compassion in these verses. Why would the Galatians of the first century, having gained freedom in Christ, want to turn back to the regulations of the law? It makes no sense. Paul emphasised, now you know God. They had experienced a relationship with the living God. Paul then rephrases his statement and says, now you are known by God. You did worship God dead idols in the past, but now you worship the living and true God. Why turn back? Paul was anguished over his own people who were lost. He had undertaken three missionary journeys recorded in the book of Acts, and on all three he visited the Galatian Christians. He loves these people, and to see them going astray not only confused him, but hurt him deeply. What Paul is displaying here is the pastor's heart. Paul continues to plead with them. He's laid out the logical and theological arguments why they should not go back to a system of works. But now he pleads with them from a very personal level. I care too much for you to sit by and see you do this. Become like me with freedom in Christ. Paul spoke of identity. You see, he had become like them to win them for Christ. Now they should be like him, enjoying the freedom that he has. Paul also reminds them of the relationship they previously had. In the past, they would do anything for Paul. Those who are back in bondage no longer feel close to those walking closely with Christ. The truth becomes offensive. And Paul asks them, what has happened to your joy? There's no longer a song in their heart. Paul talks about religious zeal. Now it can be good or bad depending on the purpose. Paul himself is very fervent for his faith. Zeal is good with the right direction and for a good purpose. But some people, like the Judaizers, have a misguided zeal and have led the Galatians astray. Paul spoke to the believers in Galatia who had strayed as my dear children. 
Paul went through much pain to take the gospel to these people. He could not forget the pain. It was again a time of emotional pain as he writes to encourage them back to the right spiritual path. But if he could see them get right in their walk with the Lord again, the pain would all be worth it. Paul now changes direction totally and talks about how to run the race telling the churches of several things it's important to keep hold of. The first is they should keep hold of their freedom. True freedom does not come from a place or an activity, but from a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who gives true freedom. Secondly, hold on to your faith. You can never be free while living by the law. The law shows that you are a slave to sin. You deserve slavery and have been given freedom through God's grace. Now your faith needs to be expressed through love. Third, hold on to a strong finish. Every Saturday afternoon there are thousands of people in utter despair as they witness their favourite football team concede a goal in the 93rd minute. I coached rugby for many years, and I always tried to teach my teams of the need to finish strong. That's what Christians need to do, finish strong. Paul points out that they were running a good race, but all of a sudden these people cut them off. Life can be like that, you're doing great, and then all of a sudden everything falls apart. The Christian life is not a sprint, but a marathon. Each day we should be running our races with the intention of finishing strong. Do not let people cut you off and slow down your race. If you've just given up and taken yourself out of the race, today is a good day to get back in the race. Paul never uses the image of the race to tell people how to be saved. He uses the illustration of the race to inform Christians how to live the Christian life. A contestant in the Greek games had to be a citizen before he could compete in the races. We do not run in order to be saved, but we run because we are saved. And Paul asked them what hindered them in the race. The Greek word for hindered is a very specific word. In the races, every runner had to stay in his assigned lane. And the word hinder is an Olympic expression. It indicates someone cutting across other lanes in such a manner as to jostle and throw another runner out of the way. So Paul asks with emphasis, who it could have been that jostled them in their Christian race. The local church is built of individual runners. Can you possibly hinder other runners who are in the race or desire to be in the race? What can hinder other people who are in the race? The quickest way to destroy the spirituality of a church is to annihilate its influence by uncontrolled speech. You see, our speech can hinder or help. It can bless or bring down. The sins of the tongue are varied and numerous. Idle and injurious gossip, hurtful fault-finding, slander, lying, destructive criticism, and boasting, to name just a few. Uncontrolled speech often wreaks havoc in the church. It harms our worship and it hurts our witness. Another hindrance is failing to yield fully to the control of the Holy Spirit. Doing God's work in the flesh boils down to depending on our influence, personality, gifts, natural resources, education and experience. 
God's work should be done under the direction of, and in the power of, the Holy Spirit. The Church is hindered when we operate without yielding to the Spirit of God and depending on Him. The filling of the Spirit will affect our witnessing, our worship, and our work. The Church is also hindered by unsympathetic members. Far too many add to the burdens of others instead of bearing their burdens. We should commend, attend and defend the Church and not hinder the Church. Paul lists nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. It's important to notice that the fruit of the Spirit is singular. There is one fruit with nine aspects. You can't pick and choose like you would at a fruit stall in the market. There is only one fruit. You've either got it or you haven't. There is a straightforward contrast with the works of the flesh. This is a lifestyle issue. Jesus had spoken a few times about fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. Good trees produce good fruit. A tree is recognised by its fruit. It is equally true that men and women are recognised by the fruit in their lives. Do they have it or not? We need to remember that this fruit is the Holy Spirit's, not ours. It's about allowing him to fill us and produce these aspects within our lives, rather than us trying to generate the elements ourselves. The first aspect of the fruit is love, and we know that God is love. The second element, joy, is love singing. Peace is love resting. Long-suffering is love enduring. Kindness is love's touch. Goodness is love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's self-forgetfulness. And self-control is love in control. It's worth noting that love and self-control are the bookends of the fruit of the Spirit. Remove one of them, and the rest fall over. God develops the fruit of the Spirit in our lives by allowing us to experience circumstances in which we're tempted to express the exact opposite quality. Character development always involves a choice, and temptation provides an opportunity. If the Galatians were looking for a detailed blueprint of how to order their lives, they might have found Paul's letter disappointing compared to the teaching of his opposition. By contrast, Paul sketches just a few short strokes in his portrayal of a community guided by the Spirit. A life led by the Spirit cannot be contained in some sort of comprehensive instruction manual. It can't be ordered and structured in any sort of predictable way. Paul has given a remarkably rich account of some traits that might characterise the common life of a spirit-led community. And it begins with understanding that life according to the spirit is not something that can simply be structured according to human expectations. So what does it mean to live by the guidance of the Holy Spirit? It's a life lived in community. We place a great deal of emphasis on independence. We can take care of ourselves. We can make it on our own. We don't need anything or anybody. But life in the Spirit is life lived in community. The Church is characterised by the interdependence of its members. And that means that we support one another in times of need. Also that we're willing to confront one another when necessary. Life led by the Spirit must also imitate the life of Christ himself. 
Paul urges his readers to bear one another's burdens, which is ultimately a call to each of us to conform our own lives to the self-sacrificial pattern of Jesus' life. This means, again, we have set aside the individualism and selfish desires and consider first the interests of others. One day a student asked the famed anthropologist Margaret Mead for the earliest sign of civilization in any given culture. She surprised her audience by answering a healed femur. You see, a healed femur shows that someone cared. She summarised the evidence of compassion is the first sign of civilization. Christ has made the ultimate sacrifice for each of us, and we can do no less than to emulate this generous sacrifice in our own lives. We must show compassion to one another at all times and in all places. Which leads to another characteristic of a life led by the Spirit. We must reject any sort of rivalry or conflict within the church. For Paul, the particular conflict in Galatia is a direct result of sowing to the flesh, that is, placing confidence not in Christ or the Holy Spirit, but in the merely human works of the law. The Galatian church experienced conflict because certain factions were trying to force others to conform to their ways. What are all the practices we're trying to force upon others in their pursuit of the Christian faith? Certainly there's the matter of worship, which is a constant battle within the church nowadays. What about the colour of the carpet, the positioning of the furniture? This is not the abundant life that God has promised us and that Christ made possible. It is death not only for those who are being excluded, but for us as well. I have a confession to make, or perhaps just an admission rather than a confession. Probably my all-time favourite popular music song is by The Hollies, and it's called, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. Apparently the name of this song came from a well-known Vietnam War photo, where an American soldier is carrying a Vietnamese man on his shoulders. A journalist had asked the soldier if he'd been carrying the man far, and the soldier smiled, looked at the camera and said, He ain't heavy. He's my brother. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ, we are all brothers and sisters through faith. And being brothers and sisters in Christ, God wants us to help each other, to carry each other in good times and in bad, to help each other stay focused on Jesus as our way to eternal life. Galatians is one of Paul's most emphatic and heated letters. Now we come to the end of the book, and Paul addresses one final tough situation. What about members of the church who profess Jesus as Lord and Saviour, and yet continue in sin? What are we to do with them? Is it their problem and not ours? Or is this a problem for the entire body of Christ? Paul doesn't beat around the bush. He says, brothers, if someone is caught up in a sin, restore him gently. In restoring a brother or sister who continue to sin, Paul is very carefully reminding us not to put our own hand back to the old life that could end up plunging us into the sinful life. Paul says, watch yourself, that you also may be tempted. What's important to remember is that temptation is not a sin. In fact, Jesus himself was tempted. 
It's when we give in to that temptation that sin is committed. So when we restore a brother or sister in the faith who continues to sin, we may also be tempted by the ways of the world. We're getting close to the fire again. We still have to care for each other, but we do it carefully with God's Spirit guiding us. Just as a soldier will never leave another soldier behind, we, as Christians, can never ignore the needs of another Christian brother or sister in the faith. Whether that person needs food, shelter, or a gentle reprimand. Paul says carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfil the law of Christ. Remember, the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Paul then says if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. What Paul is saying is the need to stay humble. We need to remember who this is all about. Jesus. The same goes for when we encounter a brother or sister in the faith who is falling. We're not to judge them, but in remembering that we ourselves are sinners saved only by the grace of God, we can gently restore that person. Paul continues, each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself. Without comparing himself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. When we love Jesus, we are adopted into God's family. We have a responsibility to others in God's family. And that's why our attitude to our brothers and sisters should be of gentle restoration. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. Letting the brother or sister continue in his or her sinful ways just isn't an option. And sometimes confronting the person with the sin can be tense. But when we really love him or her as a brother or sister in Christ, we can't help but to help them. If your brother or sister were drowning, you would certainly jump into the water to help them. People who have professed Jesus as Lord but hold on to the ways of the sinful life are literally drowning in sin. Because instead of allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to lead their lives, they are instead allowing Satan to lead them away from Christ. Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man sows, and he reaps what he sows. The one who sows to displease his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit, will reap eternal life. We can't give up because eternal lives are at stake. Paul says, let us now become weary. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore... As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Those are some powerful and pointed words of instruction. Paul is instructing us that we aren't to give up because the Holy Spirit will help us along the way. And with the Holy Spirit, we can do God's work. We can do good, not because we have to, but because we can. God wants us to serve all his children, doing his good work. But Paul goes out of the way to explain that we are to do good, including pointing out sin, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Remember, we are to restore somebody caught up in sin, We aren't to think that suddenly we're better or less sinful than that person. As we do the work of God, we should always remember that we can do absolutely no good without God the Holy Spirit living in us 
and working through us. It's always all about Jesus and never about us. Paul says, may I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It's all about Jesus and never about us. Without Jesus, we are just lost sinners. But in Jesus, we become new people, children of God adopted into his family. Of all the people ever born, Jesus Christ was the one who deserved the least to be punished for sin. He resisted every temptation. He understood God's law to love your neighbour as yourself. He understood it so well that instead of writing us off, instead of giving in to Satan's temptation, instead of calling down angels and archangels to defend him, he went to the cross for us. He bore our sins and paid for our sins. And he did this not because he had to, but because he loves us. Jesus is the ultimate example of someone who looked at his sinful brothers and sisters and instead of leaving them behind in their sinful condition, he rather understood the message of he ain't heavy, he's my brother. As we wrap up this journey through Paul's letter to the Galatians, remember the theme of the letter. Trust in God's mercy. Trust in Jesus' perfect work on the cross. Remember that, yes, you are a sinner. But by putting your faith in Christ and letting God, the Holy Spirit, take over the direction of your lives, he will lead you in the light of Christ to do his work. While we may still live in a world filled with sin, we are people who are saved, not by anything we've done, but entirely by who Jesus is and what he has done for us. If you'd like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide. Or, if you're in the Radstock area one Sunday morning, why not come along to the Baptist Church and join us for our Hoppers 10 service. You will always be very welcome. Mm -hmm.